month, NASM is giving you free courses. That's right, free courses each month just for being part of the NASM family. Learn about everything ranging from nutrition to strength, weight loss to stress relief, and everything in between. Click the link in the bio for information and to claim your free course before they're gone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Random Fit. My name is Wendy Batts, and I'm here with my friend, colleague, and co-host, Mr. Ken Miller. How are you doing today, Ken? I'm well, Wendy. How are you? Good oh, seeing you. You as well. I know that I see you every week, but it seems like a long time until we do these, and I'm like, you know. I know. I love these. Love this hour for sure. But. Well, uh, <laughs> Um, well, today I'm excited. We're talking about a fun topic of kettlebells, and um, I know a lot of people use them in the gym, but we were going to go over the history and a mm -hmm. little bit of background about them and how you can implement them into your workout if you're not already doing so and the purpose of doing it and the different ways you can do it. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, so I'm excited about today. It'll be fun. Yeah, I mean, I... Am a very not. I mean, I've seen. I have friends that kettlebell work is. You know, if they do a workout with kettlebell, it's all they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I'm not there. I mean, it's one of those. If it's there, I'll use it for more static stuff. You know, just more like a modified dumbbell. But we're gonna get into a little bit more of the, I guess, the how it originated and how it's come over to the U.S. and as far as how it's become more of a worldwide tool and and um, I'll we'll get into all that stuff but <laughs> I'm actually interested to see where this conversation goes just because I know how I use it which is kind of on a very novice level not like some associates that we have that actually compete in the thing right, so, right. <laughs> which I've tried to pick up what they actually swing or lift and curl um, and I was like how do you do that you know but yeah. it's all about technique right well, it is about technique. And I will say when I took my first kettlebell class, I was very, um, I just felt so out of my element. I mean, I use them and I like to use them and I implement them and I do certain things with the kettlebell because they're comfortable. However, when I actually took the class and saw all the different components of it and, you know, when you're thinking about it, there's 25 different grips, if not more that you can do d depending on the type of exercise mm -hmm. and the way that you're doing it. And then learning all about like, to me, this was fascinating because I had to do a lot of research because I was not well versed in, in kettlebells. I wasn't, I mean, I know about them again, but just uh, actually de digging deep. I, I was, I actually really enjoyed finding out the information that we're going to share with you. So hopefully yeah. you do too. <laughs> yeah. And um, I guess like most things when, when, we did the research actually you did your research and i and i read up on it as well um is the origin of it all but you know what it reminded me and i'll let you get into how it's come about but i think one of the things that was interesting to me as far as you know necessity being the mother of invention with with kettlebell where it had a totally different purpose versus you know versus what it's known for today with exercise, kind of like, you know, it reminded me of the original, the origination of the TRX strap, right? Mm -hmm. So if you understand where that came about, you know, you had these um, special forces, Navy SEALs out there that wanted to stay in shape and what did they have available to them? Well, they had these parachute straps and someplace to hang it from and that's where they got their conditioning, right? Push-ups, rows, you know, and all the various exercises they were able to do in the field to stay in shape. Well, <clears throat> when we talk about the kettlebells and, and what was really interesting was how it was used. And then it kind of migrated to more of a entertainment and exercise uh, purpose and then into what it is today. So that was one of the things that I saw in its, um, you know, in its history as far as where it came from and how it evolved in its use and purpose, just like, you know, what we see today with Fitness Anywhere and the TRX strap and how it evolved from parachute straps and just <laughs> the need to stay in shape, you know, when you're in employment and you're out in the field. So that was yeah. my that was my my epiphany when it came to, oh, you know, when it comes to exercise, you never know. Uh, you know was yes. And so, you know, so when you're thinking about what Ken's talking about, you know, we're looking at, 
you know, kettlebells. And for those of you guys, I know most of you guys know what a kettlebell is, but we're talking about basically it's, it looks like a cannonball with a handle and, you know, and it's made of, of steel or cast iron. And back in the day, and we're talking as early as the 1800s, um, farmers were actually using, you know, these kettlebells, if you will, as counterweights when they were weighing out their dry goods, such as grain. And then they were using that um, for measurement purposes. And then as farmers and people were trying to, you know, continue to work in the fields, they were starting to use them as actual weights. And, you know, that's how it kind of actually originated and got brought in. And so, Ken, if you want to kind of bring us into the the founder, kind of the father of weightlifting training, yeah. um, you know, when we're talking about this back into the 1800s, you know, of course, of course the man that was born in Russia. So do you want to tell us about, uh, about him? <laughs> yeah. So um, apologies to our Eastern Bloc friends when I pronounce his name, Vladislav Krajewski is the name that, um, that that comes up as far as being the the person that actually popularized kettlebell use um, back in the 1800s. So uh, as I read it, you know, he's a, he was a Russian physician mm -hmm. and considered the founding father of uh, Olympic weight training. So he goes way back in, the, in more than just kettlebell work and and as we look at competition these days, especially with the Olympics coming up um, with Olympic lifting. So here we are. We have, as, as you mentioned, when you have a weight that was used to measure grain and, you know, e eventually as it's the anatomy of the kettlebell, you know, you have the handle and you have the, you know, however heavy the kettlebell was. Now that became a matter of of competition of, of how to lift, well, how much you could lift. And with uh, Vlad, Vladislav Krajewski, here's a person now that started to use it as far as, um, as, as using it as a tool for exercise and challenge. So for those of you just joining us here on the Random Fit Show, here we are, both Wendy, Bats and I talking about kettlebells. So here, you know, we're talking about the history of kettlebells and and where it's come from. So um, that was one of the things that, you know, comes about with with the kettlebells coming back from the 1800s. And there's been some, you know, in doing the research, looking online, different stories, different backgrounds that come up as far as, you know, where it came from, whether it was Eastern Bloc country, Russia, China, things like that. But that's where most of the arrows pointed was towards Vladislav Krajewski. Yeah. And I know there are people that are trying to say, no, no, it's actually, you know, I read, I said, read about Greece. People were like, mm -hmm. no, no, it started in Greece. And then it was China and then it was Germany. And it's, you know, the old, um, the old timey Scotland. So when you look at different research, it's really hard to say. However, they are basically saying, you know, this came out of Russia. We're just going to go with that. But I do know, and we are going to say this and because it's recorded it could have come from anywhere. And plus, if I mean, you yeah. think about this, I mean, it's been used so much, especially, like I said, in the farming communities. And then it was the farmers that were doing quote, folk or folk exercises. Um, and, and so I think the, the rushing farming communities were, were kind of tagged with that. So that's kind of where we're, when we're talking about this, why we are pretty much sticking with Russia, but you know, there's so many people that were using different weighted yeah. items and it's basically, what did you have available? That's what you were going to use. And I just thought it was interesting that that's kind of where the kettlebell swings came. And that's also came yep. from where they talk about kettlebell juggling, which we'll go into detail about here in the, in the a little bit later on in the, in the show. And so, <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. it, it, it's also interesting that, you know, this happened in the 1800s, what we're talking about with the farming communities. And then, you know, you've got, you know, the use of it that was more of the circus strongmen because people are like, how much, like you said, how much can you lift? And then it became very competitive. Yeah. And so because you're thinking about it being used more for recreation yeah. and competition and strength and athletics, then in Russia and in Europe in the late 19th centuries, they were trying to do more of a competitive, you know, um, kettlebell weightlifting. And, and, you know, you're thinking and people have heard about um the uh the different types of sports it's dated back to 1885 and that's when you started yeah. hearing about the circle of amateur athletics and so 
I find all of this so fascinating because I, I truly didn't know. And so hopefully people are like, wow, that really is cool too. Because I, I was like, right. all right, the more you read about it, but then, you know, you also think, you know, there's, there's all these spoofs out there with these strong men in the circus and they, they usually have a huge kettlebell and, you know, right. uh, whether it's yeah. truly weighted to that or not, I don't know, but, right. uh, <laughs> but it makes sense now. It, it all is coming together. Now, have you, have you ever heard the phrase farm strong or country strong? No, country strong, yes. Country yes. strong, yeah. So I've, I've heard about the country strong is the way I'll hear it most. So again, as as we were reading about this, it's it, it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, you, you have this weight that is unevenly loaded because, well, compared to a dumbbell where you have a bar with, you know, evenly weighted on both sides of that bar. And here you have a handle with the weight on one side. Well, if you're swinging this thing, you know, if, if, if now it's not just used as a counterweight and now you have to swing this thing to, to get your exercise using momentum, you know, accelerating, decelerating, you know, momentum going one way or the other. I, I just think about, you know, with, you know, with our friend, uh, you know, Derek Price and, and Michelle, one of the things that they talk about is, you know, just, how do we get country strong? And what that means to me, again, translating what the kettlebell can offer, which really motivated me to now pick up, because I have kettlebells in my facility. And do I pick them up? Yeah, I pick them up, but I use them for a set, you know, maybe weight or walks, things we'll talk about later on. But now we're talking, you know, if you're country strong, you are you can pick up anything from anywhere and move it any other place, right? If you have to pick up a bale of hay, that might be, down right and you might have to stack it up on a bed uh, on a truck bed but now as the stack gets higher now that direction and how high you have to lift how far you have to throw it is changing and that's what you know i'm looking at country strong beings like you have this diversified library of movements and cap capabilities that you're able to do now that you have different weights of kettlebells let's say however it's formatted on your farm Right. You might have a 10 kilo or a 20 kilo, however big a you know bag of grain you have to weigh. But now you have, you know, if you're using it for entertainment purposes now you're or, or for exercise, now you have different weights, you know, being slung in different directions with one hand, with two hands. So again, that just gives you a capacity for work in in being able to move different directions, different speeds, different loads. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate about the kettlebell with what we found, especially how it's migrated from a practical use on the farm to now, like you said, entertainment and then competition. Yeah. Well, that brings us, you know, to thinking about this too, when you're talking about comp competition, it was 1948 that the, you know, basically that the kettlebells became more of a sport. And so when you're thinking about that, of course, we have to talk about yeah. who actually brought it over to the Western world. And so, you know, there we have, Pavel, and hopefully I don't screw this one up, but um, Zesseline, right? Zesseline. 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 Yes. I don't know. You can tell I'm so or, not Russian. I'm, or, you know, I'm part, I'm part country Pavel. and part Greek. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, Pavel, we're going to go with that. And so, yeah. you know, when you're thinking about him too, you know, he is the one that, you know, is credited with popular or making kettlebells popular and, you know, coming, you know, from the Soviet, you know, special, special Soviet Union working with special forces and then migrating this stuff over, you know, to us. I think it's it's fascinating to see that, you know, when he brought it over to the United States, it was developed more for kettlebell lifting. I mean, it truly was all about being competitive right. in sports. And so, you know, that's when you think about the CrossFit games and you start thinking about, you know, the different um, sports and then even the competitive lifting that you're seeing now in your gyms. And right. it's not just males, it's males it's females. Um, my little guy, we have kettlebells at, you know, um, in my gym at home and, you know, he loves lifting the kettlebells cause he thinks he's a strong man. And so, you know, I think it's very cute because, you know, kettlebells truly are different and, and that's one thing. And I know we're going to get into this and can, I don't mean to kind of take over here, but no, when you're please. thinking about, you know, kettlebells, they are different than dumbbells. And people are like, Oh, they're just another weight that you can use. It's just, you know, instead of it being, you know, you know, one pound or, or whatever you're, you know, not talking about, you know, everything is, is in kilograms. And so it's not that it's just, you know, you think about a dumbbell, you've got the, the center, when you pick up a, a dumbbell, it's equal sides on, on each side and you're just picking up the bar in the middle and you're holding it. So it's basically even weight. 
But you know, when you're thinking about a kettlebell, it truly does have a different um, center of mass. And mm -hmm. so, it, and you're picking it up with your hand and, you know, you can do single arm stuff. You can do two hands on, on the, um, yeah. you know, utilizing the kettlebell it depends on what you're doing and the exercise that you're trying to achieve. But there are so many benefits of using kettlebells too, because it's not just about how much can you lift. It's not about just getting stronger. You're really building explosive or explosive power, strength, cardiovascular, you know, like you're getting cardiovascular gains because there's so many different variations to it. And I like to me, I love that because I was like, you know what? I've never really used it as a cardio thing. But now after doing all the research, I, I think I'm going to start implementing yeah. implementing it more for time because like I said, I'm like, that is fantastic stuff I haven't been doing at home, but you know what? I'm going to be yeah. a whole new person by the end of this, by the end of this month, I'm going to try it out. Pray well, I don't blow my, blow out my back because I do something stupid. Yeah. You know, and, and that, you know, that, and that really, you know, makes me think about, you know, this is, you know, as it is, if, you know, and I, and I got on social media, I looked on YouTube and I, and I was watching these, these competitions in play and these guys are no joke i mean just for one that the amount of weight that they're lifting but then to do it and like you're saying from a conditioning standpoint these guys are just machines um so when i you know when i'm watching i'm like man i like what you're saying it's like i just don't want to hurt my back doing these things mm -hmm. and you know what it really brought to mind you know is as much as you and i are involved with exercise and our history with exercise this is a, I mean, this is a very much technique oriented um, activity if you're using it, you know, from more of a swing and momentum generating standpoint. So here we are, you know, talking about kettlebells here on Random Fit Show. Don't ring them, just swing them uh, with me, Ken Miller and Wendy Batts. And, and with, with all that, I just think, you know, who do I know that can sit down, actually come to my facility and train me on how to use kettlebells properly. So for those of you guys that are listening and you know me and you're actually in the Bay Area, uh, <laughs> please reach out. Uh, you know, I would love to to get more, you know, guys, because, you know, there, nothing beats a second set of eyes watching you do, you know, and you and I, we work with people and we watch other people do it. But getting this instruction before, you know, getting into understanding, I mean, just with the kettlebell swing, there are different ways just to swing the kettlebell because you're going to get you're going to elicit different responses as far as, you know, are you doing more of a squat or a hip hinge variation of a kettlebell swing, right? There's different emphasis. And plus, if your shoulders aren't in the right place, if you don't have the right posture, you're going to lose, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the benefit towards, you know, learning stability during, during these um, different, different, different movement patterns. So now if you're going to translate that into a, a kettlebell clean or a kettlebell snatch, um, you know, that kettlebell being a little bit too far can make the difference of whether or not you actually complete the movement, but more importantly, can make a difference of whether or not you're doing it safe, right? right. So whether it's for your back or your shoulder. So again, as I, as I watch, you know, I, I really, it, I really became more aware of how ignorant I am as far as <laughs> my, I mean, just physically ignorant is the way I like to say it, you know, because you know, there's, you know, conscious and, you know, and unconscious incompetence. You don't know how bad you are. And then, and then you have conscious incompetence. Now, now you, now you know how bad you are, right? So, so when I'm, when I'm thinking about doing these things, you know, trying to branch out and kind of extend myself beyond how I already use kettlebells now to get into the more of the swing vantage point, you know, to admit my, my blind spot when it comes to my training, you know, one of the things I don't do is I, I, I do, you know, some just general, you know, beginner novice level um, kettle, kettlebell swing instruction, but that's about it to get into the co competition and the heavier ballistic side of things. Um, that's where I, I know I need a little bit of help. And, and I share this because uh, for those of you now, you know, now motivated to learn about kettlebells and how to use it, uh, get some instruction, just like we say with exercise and, 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 and getting yourself in better shape, because there is such, um, you know, there are nuances when it comes to performing the kettlebell swings or kettlebell technique, various kettlebell techniques. Um, 
you know, get some instruction to have somebody watch you, have somebody who's skilled, certified, and experienced in that to, to guide you through. Because as I as I was reading through this, it was just a matter of, oh my gosh, there's, there's a lot to this that you know, and I and me being how old I am, I don't want to get hurt. I can't afford to get hurt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, and and just for an example, and this is, I think, kind of where you're going with that is if you're thinking about doing a kettlebell swing, which is what we're talking about, which is basically where you're taking the kettlebell, you're holding on to the top of, of, of the, the handle and you you go into like a kind of a, a squat position. The kettlebell goes in between your legs and then you bring it up um, with your arms straight. You know, when you're thinking about that, sometimes people associate that to be really focusing a lot on the legs and it shouldn't be because what you're really looking to do is you're doing power production and that should really be utilizing the glutes and the hips. And so the kettlebell positioning can really, really make a difference and can blow mm -hmm. out your back if you're not careful. So for example, your hand should be right up against your inner thigh. And so when you're going through, if your hands are like lower more towards your knee, then it will put more stress on your lower back and cause you to get into more of, of spinal flexion, which is not as ideal. Now, again, if we start talking about the lifting styles, there's five contemporary lifting styles that we're actually going to discuss. And that is going to be where some variations come from because it depends on, are you doing this for strength, power, endurance, and proper alignment and form, or are you doing it for a sport? Because it will truly make a difference. Because when we're talking about what I mean by that, let's say, for example, the number one is something that they call a hard style. And this is something that you're going to see more in powerlifting. And what I found very interesting is hard style came about because of the military and it's the very snappy movements. So it's like the, you know, like in cheerleaders, they're like, yay, and their hands go up and they snap it and they hold it, you know. Um, and so, you know, those really hard jerky movements where it's, you know, you're trying to hit a certain place, um, that is hard style. And so that is something too, that when you're thinking about it, it has nothing to do with relaxation. It has nothing to do with really tension. It's more of just getting it up and it's power and you stop. That's one way of doing it. However, when you're getting into what they've in, in can, I'm sorry to steal this right now, but you've got your um, gear voice sports. That's more of your fluid moments or motions. And so that is an actual sport. And so, for example, you've got to be able to do like a clean and, you know, clean and jerk or a certain type of movement for 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And so they don't care about anything other than can you do that for 10 minutes and as soon as you stop you fail your attempt and so that's one thing that you want to think about that fluid motion and so when you're learning that which is a sport totally different then they will teach you how to go into certain rotations how to go into different movement patterns um for the sake of doing that completion of 10 minutes has nothing to do with anything other than utilizing the path of re least resistance in order to execute that for that duration of time. And so for me as a trainer, watching some of that and seeing the flexion, the rotation, I'm like, oh my goodness, right, whatever I have to right. think, this is for a sport. Same thing with powerlifting. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily agree with it, but when they come into the gym or they're working with me, it's my job then to really focus on creatives and, and going against that. Right. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cross, and this is where we can start to look at, um, I mean, I'll let you continue on with those different styles, but when we look at, you know, especially our form and strategy in getting somebody in better shape and, and condition, you know, once we understand, you know, what the technique is, and this is where, you know, I work with Olympic lifters, not in teaching the Olympic lifts, but sometimes there's some deficits when it comes to range of motion and stability to perform certain lifts. So we know that if you have to do a power clean, uh, you know, you need a certain amount of ankle, ankle dorsiflexion, hip flexion, a little some core stability. And the same thing here with uh, with what you're talking about, you know, using kettlebells as a, you know, if we're looking at it as a sport, then we have to make sure that you have the requisite you know, range of motion, flexibility, stability, um, strength to perform those exercises properly. So again, you mentioned again, staying away from, you know, the, the um, possibility of injury the best you can, you know, those hands being a little bit away and performing the swing, we have to make sure one, do you have 
hip control, you have hip stability, you have hip range of motion to perform those those movements properly, especially now if we're looking at how you're going to use the kettlebell in those different ways that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yes, and those of you guys that are just joining us, I'm here with Ken Miller, I'm Wendy Batts, and we're talking about kettlebells. Don't just ring them, you need to swing them. <laughs> and so we're literally talking about the different lifting styles. And so, so far I've covered obviously the hard style and then um, the gear of always sports, which is more of the fluid or the more more based on strength endurance because of the time and again that's more of a specific sport but then you also have to look at the the crossfit kettlebell and when you're talking about that that's really implementing more of the the cross you know fit style of training and basically you know their curricula their studies and so there are going to be some significant mod significant modifications within some of those swings for example doing an american swing versus a conventional swing or you know placing you know the kettlebell down in between snatches that's totally different than what we were talking about with different sports and so you know that is another lifting style if you will and so depending on, you know, what way you want to train, you really want to think about the style of lifting. Um, so that would be the third right. one. The fourth one, and I don't know, Ken, if you've seen any videos, but oh, they yeah. showed some amazing yeah. military videos um, of, <laughs> of kettlebell juggling. And guys, yeah, I'm telling you, if you have yeah. never seen it, it is I mean, it's like watching Cirque with kettlebells. I mean, it is yeah. amazing um, because you can do in, in is, what I'm talking about is kettlebell juggling and you take a kettlebell and you're flipping around and you're flinging it in different, you know, different places and you're catching it going into different, um, you know, um, presses and different um, swings. It's fascinating to watch and you have to be in an exceptional shape in order to catch the kettlebell the correct way and then to make sure that you are dialed in on every every um, position that you're trying to hit so therefore you're reducing chances of injury mm -hmm. um, but I saw it done in a competition with military guys and I think there was I think five or six of them and they were tossing kettlebells back and forth to each other in different positionings walking around I mean it was fascinating and I was just in awe because <laughs> of the athleticism that you would need in order to do right. that and that brings us back into the history that we talked about because they were doing that on the farm, throwing it back and forth to each mm -hmm. other and lifting. So right. when we're talking about lifting and juggling, that was brought into the 1800s, but now they're bringing it into more of a sport fashion. Um, you know, when they're flipping things around, you're usually gonna see yeah. more in the sagittal plane, so front and back. But when they started doing more frontal and rotational stuff, I'm like, dude, that's just- No. Yeah, I'm gonna lose a foot if I tried anything like that. Dude, I would, I would lose my <laughs> teeth. There's no way if I've got a huge kettlebell coming towards my face and it's yeah. flipping around that I'm gonna successfully catch that. I can barely catch a medicine no, ball that's coming no. when I get tired. No way. So yeah, yeah. paid professionals only. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there needs to be the no. warning label. Like I think, I think, yeah, I think watch. Yeah, exactly. Warning. Do not <laughs> attempt this. <laughs> at all unless you're a professional <laughs> well i think that's what kind of scared me the most i mean you when you look at all the possibilities i mean like you mentioned you know Gervoy, the, the crossfit kill and, and then juggling i think juggling is the one that's like I, th I think i took more personal like if i tried that i mm -hmm. i would lose a limb or someone be, would be maimed in some way shape or form because i mean and that again just and again i like to think about okay for something to get at that level where do you start Right? right. You know, are you starting like, OK, hey, you just stand a foot in front of me and let's go ahead and toss it like like an egg toss. You know how you like toss it to you, you toss it to me and then we step, take one step farther back and then we keep going until we're like, you know, 20 yards apart. Right. But I can't imagine like where do you start with this thing? Like, OK, here, let's let's start off with a two kilo. Let's start off with a four kilo. All right. You know, you did well at that. Let's go six kilos and let's go 10 kilos. And then, OK, let's let it to spin a couple more times than that. But. I don't know. I, I, just, I look at it like think about soccer players. You know how like when they get bored, they start kicking the ball and doing all these fancy tricks with themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. maybe that's just it. These people are so dialed in kettlebells. They're like, I got to do something to spice <laughs> yeah. it up. I, you know, it's or golfers, how they can bounce it on their club forever and then hit it. I mean, maybe that's they sat in the in their at home and decided like, <laughs> I, I want to know this, if I could the, do that. This. Or do you start with like the foam, like foamy ones, just so you know, you don't break your, you know, your forearm when it hits you in the back or I mean, I don't, I don't know. So 
you know, but the fifth one, just to, just to kind of like close this part of it out is the typical kettlebell training that we would normally see in the gym. And it's really kind of a different types of combination of all, but we're really focusing more on your mobility and your flexibility and your cardiovascular endurance, mm -hmm. of course, your strength and your power. Right. And so, you know, and it's, it's very, you're doing it more for repetitions. You're doing it more based on form and you're, there's a specific outcome that's not necessarily timing, you know, time generated or, you know, can you hit a certain, you know, um, a certain right. press, you know, like in a set in a snappy way um, or, you know, again, you're not doing CrossFit. So I think that's the one that we see most of the time. And and like I said, you have to have very, very good core strength. You have to be able yeah. to, you know, make sure that you've got, you know, hollow abs or you can draw in. You've got really good glute activation, especially when you're doing things overhead, because that is really what's going to make you successful. And um, right. there was a study mm -hmm. that I saw, um, an article that was, you know, involved Stuart McGill. And he's a huge researcher, you know, and the differences yeah. between drawing in and hollowing and, and, you know, basically low back safety. And he always said that there's no significant um, gain, obviously, um, if you've got lumbar flexion when you're doing kettlebell work. And so that's why I said it's different when right. you're thinking about sport relation. And we know not just, you know, McGill, but any research, you're always going to want to protect your spine by making sure that your, you know, your core is dialed in and those little muscles that protect the spine, they really need to be in a good position before you start yeah. doing some of these heavy swings, you know, and that's why, as you mentioned, hiring someone to show you how to do a proper swing, a pro yeah. you know, the hinges are, are huge. If you can't do a, right, a good hip hinge, then, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter if you're using a barbell, if you're using a kettlebell or something, you are going to have issues with your lower back. And so just making yeah. sure that you're very dialed and comfortable before you put a kettlebell in your hand and start swinging it, you know, at a faster pace is going to be extremely, extremely important. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a hundred percent on all of that, especially with, yeah, I agree. Thanks, man. You. <laughs> you're, you're right on. Uh, every once in a while. Okay. Yeah, every, every once in a while, uh, more often than you think, Wendy. Uh, so when, when it, when it does come to that, you know, you know, and, and Stuart McGill, I mean, he's got you know, more than a few books out there, but, uh, you know, the, the idea of making sure that, you know, you're able to control, especially with the hip hinge. And, and that's where I'll use, um, you know, kettlebells now within, within my training sessions, kind of more like a, maybe a, 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 a that hip hinge pattern or teaching, uh, fundamental movements, like say a a beginner position for a, a deadlift, right? Or there's even, you know, this, the straight leg deadlift. So just teaching those positions using a lighter kettlebell, of course, but and that, you know, because the 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 way they have, the handles are fashioned, I, I like using the kettlebell actually for those type of motions because now if I can teach you to keep your shoulders in a good, what they call pack position, holding the kettlebells and then hinging from that position or even from a deadlift position, I'll use the kettlebells quite a bit from that vantage point, but um, also Turkish get-ups. You know, I'll I'll use a kettlebell from that vantage point, um, just because I love the get-up because it it has so many very variations in body position and with holding that arm. And maybe we should do a, a podcast on um, Turkish get-ups, but uh, <laughs> but from that position, I mean, you there's a lot of dynamic stability that's required, and mm -hmm. for you to talk about you know, having good core awareness. Um, there's definitely recruitment of the hips, especially when you get into that bridge position and the transition from, you know, your forearm up to that kneeling position. And then from the kneeling into the stand using a kettlebell with that offset weight that we talked about just based on how it's built out. You know, there's a lot that the kettlebell, you know, on top of conditioning the strength and the power that you mentioned, um, that it offers from a stable stabilization and body awareness standpoint, just because of the offsetting weight. So that's where you know that's where I'm more comfortable using, especially with compound movement like a Turk to get up. But all for the purpose of teaching somebody, okay, here's how we can move our hips. Here's how we should move our hips when it comes to you know you know the hip hinging and then from ground to stand, which we you know we we both know that's where um you know we're teaching total body movement patterns from from yeah. that vantage point and, and the kettlebell is a great modality to help um, educate somebody about their body and how how they can maneuver you know ground to stand and then back to the ground again 
Well, and I mean, there's a lot of positive, um, you know, information out there too, talking about, you know, as you get a stronger grip, the benefits that you can have overall, like throughout your core and throughout your body. And so I think, you know, having the different positions with the grip itself yeah. and, you know, the, the standard yeah. hold is basically where you have, you know, have it in the palm of your hand and the actual, um, kettlebell is basically resting up against your form. That's the standard way. Right. But like you said, doing bottom ups, which means, you know, you're holding it and the, the kettlebells yeah. upside down. Um, you know, I do that a lot. I do, uh, you know, like you said, it's easier to do carries and there's so many different exercises and everything. But, you know, when you're thinking about grips, I mean, if you guys ever watch the, you know, American Ninja Warrior, I mean, you know, they're like, look at their grips and, you know, how strong their fingers and stuff are. I mean, maybe they just do a kettlebell workout. You just never know. But, um, but it's important you know, not just talking about lower mm -hmm. back, but you also want to think about the positioning of how to hold the kettlebell, because if you don't hold it correctly and you have it too much in the palm of your hand, if you're not careful, right. you'll get a lot of blisters and then you end up with some significant issues there, um, which will put yeah. you out of, of working out just in general until your hands heal. So just making sure that you feel comfortable with how hard do you hold it? How heavy is it more in your fingertips? Is it more resting in your hand? And, you know, mm -hmm. is it moving too much? I think all of that just on the safety standpoint, you know, just have a good base of support, play around with it, hire a trainer um, to show you how to do it correctly yeah. if you don't know, but have fun with yeah. them, bring them into your workout, enjoy it. Um, I mean, that's, that's those are my key takeaways and just realize yeah. that, you know, you can now go out in the world and tell everyone about the history yeah. of kettlebells because you heard it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, I'll just kind of write on that coattail, it's just, Get some, I mean, it is, you know, it's just like anything, there is technique to it. I mean, and it can be used, you know, just like Olympic, it could be used as a modality and it can be a sport. So just like any sport, you need a good coach, right? And from a safety standpoint and from an efficiency standpoint, get some instruction and, you know, don't come to me for kettlebell work. I mean, I'll use it, what, how I use it, carries, bottoms up, you know, goblet squats, things like that. But, you know, if you want to get to a higher level, don't come to me. I'll, I'll admit that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this was this was great. This was fun. I, I super I fun. A lot. Yeah. I mean, research and talking to you, of course. Uh, but uh, for those of you listening to us here on the Rand the Fit, thank you for listening to us on this episode regarding the kettlebells, uh, which was 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 really fun to figure out, you know, where it actually came from. But anyway, <laughs> thank you guys for. <laughs> So I might have to do some more research on it. Uh, <laughs> like, follow, subscribe, download, comment. Let us know if there's anything else what we can give to you information-wise on Random Fit. So thank you again. Until next time, take care and be well.